In this video, I want to link the CAPM that we normally see in textbooks to how we actually estimate the beta that goes inside CAPM. The stock I'm going to be using for this example is Apple. I'm going to be using monthly stock returns from around 2000 through 2010. Uh, a lot of interesting things happened during that time period, so you know I'm interested in see how CAPM actually works out during this period, during that decade. So the way we normally see CAPM is uh, this formula right here. We're saying that the expected return of stock I is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. So the entire market risk premium is that entire chunk in parentheses, which is the expected market return minus the risk-free rate. All right, so that's the CAPM that we normally see in textbooks. But we don't actually estimate this when we are estimating beta. What we estimate when we estimate beta is based off this formula down here. So when we estimate beta, we're saying the return at time t, so in a particular month, let's just say the return in January of 2000, is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the return of the market in that particular month in excess of the risk-free rate plus epsilon t. This epsilon t here, that's the idiosyncratic shock in that particular month. That is a particular piece of good news or bad news. So say iPhone sales came out and they were higher than expected. That would be a good piece of news. Or perhaps uh, a bad piece of news could be the announcement of Steve Jobs' deteriorating health. Bad piece of news. That could be a negative idiosyncratic shock. Importantly, though, that idiosyncratic shock is firm specific. One thing I do want to mention is when we are um, saying that this is how returns are generated, so uh, the return in time t is generated according to this formula, we're saying that cap m is actually true. It, it is how returns are, are generated. The only things that matter are the risk-free rate, the beta of that stock, which is our measure of systematic risk, what the market does, and then any idiosyncratic news. This is obviously a pretty darn strong assumption, but we're going to roll with it for a little bit. So what I did is I grabbed the stock returns for Apple, the monthly stock returns for the month of, or sorry, the decade of 2000. And what I've got here is I, I plotted the market excess return on the x-axis. So that is whatever the return in that particular month was minus the risk-free rate. Um, and on the y-axis over here, I've got Apple's excess return. Each uh, point is the actual excess return for both the market and Apple. So in this month, whatever it was, there was a good piece of news, um, and or likely a good piece of news, that resulted in Apple's stock being particularly high. Conversely, Conversely, down here, there was a bad piece of news, or likely a bad piece of news. But each one of these blue dots is a particular return in a particular month. So in that formula, each blue dot would be a return with a subscript T. The regression that we actually run in Excel is we're going to move the... Um, the risk-free rate to the other side of the equal sign. So we're going to be estimating the, the excess return in that particular month. So that would be um, what we actually have plotted here on the x-axis. Oops. We're also going to throw in this constant alpha. Hmm. So we're going to throw in this constant alpha there. This is um, not baked into the theoretical version of CAPM. This is going to be any excess return that we have over this time period. We'll, we'll dig into alpha here in, uh, in a second. Anyhow, we're going to regress the excess return on Apple on a constant plus some coefficient, which is what we're estimating, we're estimating that beta, times the market uh, excess return plus 
our idiosyncratic shocks. So when I estimated the beta, which is acting as a sensitivity measure uh, to market returns, I estimated each um, or estimated a beta of I think 2.7, um, which I or not sorry, a beta of 1.71. And I calculated an alpha of 2.97. Now that alpha is a little bit, no, it's very ridiculously high, but this was a weird time period. So each one of these orange dots here represents the predicted value of Apple's return conditional on a particular market return. So let's just say the, the market return or market excess return was 5%. We would predict according to CAPM, that the return would be somewhere around that red dot. But depending on whether there was a good piece of news or a bad piece of news, the actual return in that given month is going to be different. So let's say the market, the market was up uh, 5% over that month, or uh, in excess, uh, up over the uh, risk-free rate 5%, but the Apple also got a piece of good news, well, that might be the particular return in that month. This distance right here, that's our epsilon. That's our epsilon in time t. That is our piece of idiosyncratic news. That is our uh, idiosyncratic risk. So we estimated the beta, and that was um, uh, like about 1.7. And we also estimated the alpha. Now the alpha is our intercept mechanically. That is this distance right there, the difference between zero and our intercept. Now, how do we interpret that alpha? And this is where it gets kind of fun. So I estimated an alpha of 2.97. So we can interpret this in one of two ways. One way we can interpret alpha is that cap M is true. Um, we just make that assumption that cap M is true and that over the month, or sorry, the decade of the 2000s, Apple had a string of positive idiosyncratic shocks. So they had a lot of idi uh, positive idiosyncratic shocks in a row. And because this time period was, uh, was a little bit weird, their average epsilon t was greater than zero. Mechanically, this is going to make the constant, or in this case, our alpha, greater than zero. If CAPM was actually true, then we would expect if we saw enough returns over a, let's just say over a hundred years or over a thousand years, eventually the average epsilon was, would be zero. So the, there would be a balance of good news shocks and bad news shocks. If the average epsilon was zero over the, the really, really, really long run, then we would expect an alpha of zero. Under a strict interpretation of CAPM, that's what we expect. Now, we know that CAPM isn't a particularly good model. This is why we have all those multi-factor models. So one way, um, or another way to interpret that alpha is say that suppose CAPM isn't true. We could interpret that alpha as uh, some unobserved risk factor. So there's some risk factor out there that Apple has exposure to. Now, if we don't measure that risk factor, if we don't measure it, then it's going to look like Apple is high, having higher expected returns than the, than the systematic risk dictates. But it's really just compensation for risk. It's real, this 2.97 that we're calculating is just compensation for some risk that we don't uh, measure. All right, so those are two different ways to interpret this alpha. One is that during this time period, something was just a little bit weird. The other is that CAPM isn't true, and we're just not capturing all uh, the additional risks. Now, let's uh, shift gears a little bit, and instead of thinking about uh, Apple as a stock, let's think about an investment manager and what alpha means for an investment manager. So let's suppose you are a portfolio manager and that you intentionally bought Apple in 2000 and then intentionally sold it in 2010. Um, I'm going to make the, uh, the, the assumption 
that you bought Apple because of some uh, superior skill in analyzing market dynamics. Uh, another way to, to, to say that is that you have some skill at generating private information from public data. Um, in my class, one of the things I make a big deal out of is that private information, generating private information, is the source of alpha. Anyhow, so in, um, in the case of Apple, uh, the alpha during this time period was 2.97. And I'm making the assumption that the manager intentionally bought it in 2000 and intentionally sold it in 2010. Well, in this case, alpha is going to be our measure of skill. It's going to be our measure of uh, excess return over this time period that is not associated with systematic risk. Now, it's very possible that this alpha is due to some unobserved risk factor and the portfolio manager has just uh, got lucky and we're mismeasuring risk, but if CAPM is the correct risk adjustment model, then this alpha is a measure of that portfolio manager's skill. If we were doing this for real, I would probably use something like the Fama French three-factor model or the Fama French Carhartt four-factor model or some sort of style-adjusted benchmark. But for the simple case, if we're thinking about the, the performance of a portfolio manager, then alpha is our measure of outperformance. So hopefully after this video, you uh, can link, you can link the concept of the beta or the cap M that we see in um, in textbooks, saying the expected return is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the expected market risk premium, and then you can hopefully tie that to what we're actually estimating with beta. And actually, the one last thing that I want to do is I want to tie this alpha to the security market line. So the security market line, just as a reminder, shows the relationship between beta, the systematic risk of the stock, and the expected return of the stock. So the security market line is going to have an intercept of the risk-free rate when beta is zero, and at least in a cap M world. The security market line is going to be there. So beta for Apple was about 1.7. So, and if we dot that up, whatever this return is right there, whatever that is, that should be the expected return of Apple under the assumption that cap M was true. But we found that there is an alpha. That is outperformance during this time period for a stock that had a beta of 1.7. So the, what that would look like is we would take this point, we would go up here. And that will, this point right here would be the, uh, the return for Apple during this time period. This distance right there, that's the, uh, the alpha for Apple. So this is how you tie the uh, estimating beta based off the time series of Apple's stock returns to a beta, and then we can plot alpha on the security market line for one particular result. So hopefully um, this video was informative, and um, thank you for watching.